But anyway, yeah, it would be good. For it. Good morning. Welcome to um, Trails, Tales, and a Bit of Truth. I'm Kirk Siegel, the director of Lucid Land Trust, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm just very briefly going to say a couple things. And um, this type of gathering is what Mahusa Land Trust and the Valentine Farm uh, Conservation Center, we hope to do a ton of um, just fun events that involve the community. So uh, thanks so much for uh, Richard Marshall working with us to pull this off. Um, we were just talking a few minutes ago about apps where you can point your phone at a flower and it'll tell you what it is, um, or point your app at a sign and it'll tell you in a different country what the sign says. Um, there's no way that I don't think any any app will ever be able to replicate what, what uh, John White and Mac Davis have done this morning. Um, uh, any of the... So, thank you guys so much. Um, I am going to turn this over to uh -oh. Find a battery or something. Um, I'm going to turn this over to, to uh, Kat Ingraham of Mahusa Heart and Soul, and we'll get we'll get things rolling. Okay. okay. So the microphone uh, is dead. It, it's fine. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for getting up early and joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. Too loud for you. Yeah. Sorry. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome to the Valentine Farm, and thanks again for making us some lovely food. And Melinda, thank you for your cinnamon rolls. And thanks to Anna Cisco for the bagels, even though she's not here, and to the Food Liner for donating eggs. Um, I'm Kat Ingraham. I'm the project coordinator for Mahusik Heart and Soul. And what we've been doing for the past two years is collecting stories from local people to discover what they love about living in this area and what they would like to see this place be in the future. Um, one of the things we've heard quite a bit about is the deep connections that people feel to this landscape and to the physical assets of the area in the great outdoors. And we thought it would be a great opportunity to get together here at the Land Trust, eat some yummy food, and share some stories of outdoor experiences. So without further ado, John White, right here, main guy, will be our first storyteller today. Oh yeah, sorry, I was supposed to have everybody introduce themselves and I forgot. So right. I'm Kat Ingraham. I'm from Saco originally and I live in Bethel. Um, Nancy, you're chewing. You want me to go the other way? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm always looking to upstate. Uh. <laughs> My name's David Walker, and I live in Newry. Bonnie Pooley, Albany Township. Kirk Seagill, Albany Township. Jonathan Goldberg, Bethel. Rose Goldberg, Bethel. <laughs> Chris Decato, Bethel, Maine. Dick Cross, Bethel, Maine. Judy Cross, up the road. Kathy Newell, Greenwood. Larry Decato, Bethel. Andy Alford, Hanover. Doug Alford, Southhouse. Jeff Angelo, Bethel. Nicole Bernier, Woodstock. Jerry Bernier, Woodstock. Amy Chapman, Greenwood. Tony Chapman, Washington, Greenwood. Melinda Remington, um, Bethel, and Largo, Florida. Scott Kelchner used to be Scott Smith, once in Bethel, <laughs> lots of other places, now Corvallis, Oregon. Jane Chandler, Brian Pond. Andrew Siegel, Albany Township. Martha Siegel, Albany Township. Monica Mann, Woodstock. Skip Rapetto, uh, Bethel, Maine, via Anchorage. Liz Rapetto, new to Bethel, from Alaska. Nancy Babcock, new. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. And now that we all know each other, it should be a little bit easier for the storytellers to do the eats. Um, so yeah, this is in the tradition of the mock radio, so true stories told live without notes. Yeah, that's true. Um, but thank you, John. Um, Vaughn, do you have a humor story about canoe? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this one isn't that funny, so. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been a main guide for about 57 years now, I guess. Um, 250 plus documented trips. I just got off the Allagash a week ago today from my 74th Allagash trip. 
So things happen, right? My mother had a word, another expression for it with young people. I won't, I won't use that one. Um, I tell this story not for what I did, which I eventually got involved heavily in this one, but for the, the lesson in, uh, in the accidents that happen, uh, mostly are preventable. You wonder when you send your kids off to summer camps, <clears throat> is it really okay to drop them off and drive home and not worry about what they do during the summer? Um, they are going to be exposed to risk. Uh, you really can't help it, and that's part of the growing up process. <clears throat> So I'm guiding for Camp Arcadia in Casco, Maine, as I am the, actually the third white to lead trips for them. My son is the fourth, but he can't do it right now. Um, so we're on the Allagash, and we see this group go by us, and it's obvious they have no experience. I'm okay. Yeah, you guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was a sergeant in a weapons platoon in the Marine Corps, so just <laughs> yell at me, I'll speak up. Um, so I, we noticed they didn't have any skill um, when they went through Long Lake Dam. The kids were going in and out of the bushes and turning pinwheels and getting out. And I'm going, oh man, they're going to have a long, hard trip. But anyway, a few days later, I get down to Big Allagash Falls, which is a 40-foot drop. It's not straight like the Canadian side of Niagara. It goes down through some ugly rocks. Pretty, pretty nasty place. And I, we've got a campsite. Um, so the falls are right out there, about 300 yards. And so the Portage Trail is way up to the left. And I getting my kids organized in the campsite, I hear screaming out here, and I say, look, that's not, that's not fun screaming. I grab some stuff, I, I split my two women's trip leaders to take uh, some kids up, and I go, I go running down, because I am sure somebody's coming over the falls. So we run down, I look up, there's nothing. Nothing in the pool, nothing I can see. So I, we run back. And, and on the way by, I asked one of my kids, grab my rescue bag out of the campsite. They know which one it is. They grabbed it. And uh, we went out, and I heard my other trip leader up here saying, John, I've got them. They're out here. So if you pass those pictures around, one of them sh clearly shows a paddle stuck in a rock um, closer to shore than the canoe is. And that's the only thing that saved those 12, two 12-year-old girls from going over Allagash Falls was the fact that their paddle jammed in a ledge in a crack, and it didn't, it didn't just, you know, they were able to grab onto it. The canoe hit the rock, spun around at a weird angle. The girl in the stern, little Asian girl <coughs> with glasses, she crawled over the load, and she had one foot on the rock, one in the canoe, and holding the paddle down tight to the ledge, really down low. Smart move. The, one, the girl in the bow was clutching the gunnels and crying inconsolably. The two <laughs> trip leaders were, one of them was a basket case. She was, she was incapable of giving any support or help whatsoever. She was just completely out of it. The other one, I said, do you, do you want me to do this to get your kids out of here? Or can you do it? She says, no, please, you do it. So I grabbed two male counselors, young men in their 20s from Camp Winnebago. I will not tell you the camp name that had these two kids. Um, I asked them, I said, okay, you guys have got to be my anchor on the end of the rope. I tried to get in the water, tied on. I couldn't. It was too deep, too fast. So I made a bowling loop you know, about the right size for 12-year-old girls, and I... I, I said to the counselor who was up on the ledge above me, I said, talk to your girls and tell them not to move. Tell them I want the girl in the bow first um, and that they cannot be reaching for the rope. It has to come to them. So I have a floating polypro rope, 3 8 inch. And it's important that it floats because you got. I had to throw that loop 40 to 45 feet out and float it down to down toward the edge of the canoe, and it can't be sinking on you all the time. So it, I, the second throw, 
I, I just let it go, and it went across the girl's lap in the bow, and she, she was able to grab the rope, and I, I said, look. <laughs> <laughs> Which she did, and uh, then the two boys from Camp Winnebago, I said, okay, we're going to zip them right out. We, I was probably 40, 40 to 50 feet upstream of them when you see where the canoe was. You can't do it perpendicular to them. You drag them over the fall. So it's upstream. Um, and then that long throw, got our, we just, I said, okay, step out on that rock. And we just yanked her. We served her right up to me. Picked her out of the water, took the rope off, handed her up to her counselor, and the other girl, the little Asian girl, I mean, she was just absolutely perfect. She was just, she was still just like this. And the, and the canoe swung around the falls, breaking down right, right down here below. She's right just like that. So I didn't have to speak to her. She knew the drill. I got the rope to swing by the canoe enough. She was able to reach out with one hand take hold of that rope. She did it one hand at a time and re-grasp. And we, we yanked her out and the counselor said, uh, can you get my canoe? <laughs> I'm saying to myself, yes, but again, I won't say what I said to her about it. And I walked away. I, and I, I tell you, it was, it's one of those moments I, I never thought about it. It's just something you, you just say, okay, you can do this. It's okay. You can do it. Get these two kids. Four or five steps. I crawled up over the ledge. Four or five steps later, I was crying. <laughs> and for the next half hour, I was in the basket case. I couldn't do anything. Um, but that, that adrenaline thing, I guess, when it wears off. It's like, <laughs> Why did I ever do that? That was so stupid. But, I, 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 I tell that because look, the camp, the two camp counselors were camping, were canoeing together, which is a no-no under American Camping Association rules. They're always supposed to be one in front, one in behind, close enough together so they can communicate, no matter what the condition. So they. Those two women counselors, quite young, 22, 23 years old, had been on the Allagash the previous year and were trailing their kids. They knew where the portage trail was. They let those kids have past the portage trail and go down another 275 yards where I normally go and get out, but they just kept going. They, they didn't know where to stop. And they, and they probably couldn't stop when I saw their canoeing trail. <coughs> So I didn't know who they were. I really didn't care. I, what I needed to do was done. Uh, I, I got out to Allagash the next morning <clears throat> about noon time. Our kids were having lunch. We had to canoe down to St. Francis on the St. John. I walked up through the village to see a friend of mine. Came back across the bridge, looked down and said, damn, there are two Allagash waterway trucks and three guys in dress uniform standing in the parking lot. I said, oh. I don't need this right now. So Matt LaRouche, the head of the waterway, was there. And he said, John, he handed me a notebook and a pen. He said, I need a report. I said, Matt, you're not getting a report until I get through with my responsibility with my trip, which ends this afternoon in St. Francis. I took him in the cab of the truck and showed him those pictures on my phone, on my camera. I don't have a phone. Um, he said, oh, my God. I said, yeah. Oh my God, it's right. And I said, I will send you a report, but after I get home, get back to my laptop computer, I'll do it for you. Uh, and I said, when I wrote the report, I said, Matt, you need to do something to these camps. If they kill a kid, it's gonna land on all of us and eat these trips. We can't let them get away with it. So he did ban them from the Allagash for three years, but um, it does make you wonder sometimes what, what what they're doing with your children when you drive away and spend the summer someplace. That's, hopefully you got a happier story. Dropped off our side at orientation. That saved them. That
I have a lot to say. All right, everybody has coffee and food and is comfortably seated. Yeah? Okay. Well, after John frightened us with that story of camp, um, hopefully Bonnie has some positive things to say because up next is Bonnie Pooley. Many of you know her from town, um, her various volunteering, her work with Gould, but I don't know if anyone here knew she's been a main guide for over 25 years or not. No? I don't know. But uh, yeah, so Bonnie Pooley is up next to tell us a happier story about canoeing. Yeah, my story, am I, I can't tell if I'm on it or not. Yeah, you're okay. you're my story is kind of the opposite of John's in every way. <laughs> it's really a great juxtaposition. Uh, I, this, this story took place in 1992. I got out my old journal, and there it was. Um, <laughs> glad I kept the journal, because I, this is all truth. Okay. Of course. And I oh, truth. No little um, bit of truth, huh? <laughs> no little bit of truth. Okay. So I was newly a main guide in 1992, and I was also newly divorced, and I was feeling free and strong and ready to conquer the world. And I thought to myself, the best way to continue proving to yourself that you are worthy of this honor of being a main guide is to go out solo and travel. I had traveled on my bicycle solo, but that's kind of not the same. There are people all around. Plus, I got a dog when I got divorced, and the dog had to go with me. So the two of us set out in our canoe. We were going to do a leisurely trip, and I realized many of you know all the campsites and, that I'm going to mention, and so you'll, you can picture exactly where I was. We were going to go from Lily Bay on Moosehead Lake, up, around, jump over to the West Branch, down the West Branch, <coughs> leisurely, the journal, I was writing, I was I was introspecting, looking at my life, trying to figure out, you know, who am I now? What am I trying to do? What's important to <laughs> me? Um, so I was planning to be out for probably two weeks. And I was coming to the end of that two weeks. So, you know, supplies were getting low. Uh, everything was going well. I had had no disasters like John's at all. Um, well, no, wait, I take that back. I had gotten windbound on Moosehead for three days, at which time I read both of my books, and all I had left was a guide to identify trees. So it was either journaling or identifying trees from that moment on. Uh, so I'm at um, Little Rag Buff, and I set out the next morning. Apparently I had too many cups of tea, which is what began this story. Um, my plan was, as I came around to Chisungkuk Village, out into, or yeah, out into Chisungkuk, I was going to stop at the Chisungkuk Inn and make a, whatever they had in those days, a sat phone call to the people who were going to deliver my truck to the bottom of uh, Chisungkuk Lake in a couple of days. So I knew I had to stop at Chisungkuk Inn to get the phone and pay the guy an outrageous amount of money to make a little phone call. <laughs> so I stopped at the first landing as you come out. Oh, no, wait, wait, go back because of the cups of tea. I <laughs> had to stop at Pine Stream Campground or Camp. And there was a family there. And um, by that point, I really had to stop. So I, I ran up to the campsite quickly introduced myself and said, may I use your porta pot or your outhouse, whatever you've got there. Oh yes, go right ahead. They were very kind. And I came back and they offered me a cup of coffee, as I'm thinking, and um, we sat for a few minutes. They were from Manhattan. Um, apparently had rented all of their equipment. It was a, a dad and a mom and three kids. I think there were two daughters and a, a young son who explained to me, they explained to me, he was traveling incognito. So though. They wouldn't tell me his real name. We were calling him Bob. <laughs> okay, okay. Hi, Bob. Glad to meet you. We had a cup of coffee. We had a lovely time. I continued on down to come around into Chisungkuk, where the lake opens up, and it's gorgeous. Um, stopped at the first landing, because I had heard a rumor that there was a store in Chisungkuk. 
and I've been eating my uh, Spartan diet for almost two weeks and was thinking, a store sounds really good. I had a dry bag which had in it my wallet and, you know, sunscreen and all the various things you carry in your dry bag that you want to be able to get to. So, I, on this trip, my first solo trip now, I was carrying $350 huh? for emergencies. Yeah, right. well, like, for what? What? <laughs> what are you thinking? Anyway, you to to <laughs> I probably had a credit card too and my driver's license and my health card. So uh, I thought, well, let's just go find that store. I got out. If you've been to Chisungkuk Village, you know that there are about four houses. Well, there was there were no people there. But then I saw up ahead of me a sign that said, store. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I started walking with the dog, with the dry bag, up the hill, found the store, big red letters on the side of the White House said, store. <laughs> Knocked on the door. The, the man who has been there forever, I think he's probably gone by he's now. actually home? Was home, yes. <laughs> and, he, and he invited me in. And I went in and, and uh, I said, so what do you have in your store? Because I didn't see anything. <laughs> he says, I have fudge and I have root beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what I wanted. <laughs> fudge and root beer. So I, I sat there with him and talked to him because obviously this is a fairly lonely man. There was nobody that goes to that store. And I uh, drank my root beer, which was the best root beer I'd ever had in my entire life. Um, put away the fudge in my dry bag for later. Uh, oh, and then he had a donut for the dog. Oh, that was very, <laughs> a very nice donut. <laughs> Headed back down the hill to the canoe, realized that now I had to, and the wind was starting to freshen, and I had to paddle around the point, um, and on the other side, that's where Chasunkuk house was. So, um, dog and I loaded up, we paddled around, we stopped at the landing of the Chasunkuk house, and it's a, it's a, was, I think it's burned down now, uh, a beautiful, old-fashioned, summer home kind of thing that was now a, a hotel. Um, so I got out of the canoe with the dog on her leash, thinking, you don't want a dog running around this lovely inn. True. So I tied her <laughs> to a tree, turned around uh, to go back out on the dock, just in time to see my open dry bag, which I had put on the dock, fall over oh. and the contents empty into the water. Oh, no. uh, oh, shoot, oh, fudge. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, oh, shoot, my $350. <laughs> uh, and then I glanced over to the right where my canoe was now about 15 yards from the dock because in worrying about the dog, I had forgotten to tie up the canoe. Oh. It was leaving, <laughs> going down the lake. So I snatched off my glasses and my hat and everything else just got to go. Okay, so fully clothed, I dived into the water, swam after my canoe, um, and thank God, I caught it. <laughs> uh, towed it back against the against the waves, got it back to the dock, tied it up, and then clambered soaking wet up onto the dock to see if I could possibly see my wallet and my fudge. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I could see them about eight feet down, but it was a very silty bottom. And I am not a good underwater swimmer, and I thought, you know what? With that silt, you have one chance. If you stir up the bottom, you're not getting that wallet and you're not getting that fudge. So, I thought, okay, the best plan here, see, I'm thinking like John now, the best plan, go up to Chisunkuk Inn and see if anybody's got a neck and with a long handle so that I can carefully reach down and scoop it out. So I walk up to the Chisunkuk Inn and the front door opens and I thought there was no one there. There was everyone there. The entire Manhattan family was there. Bob was there. And they were, they said, what were you doing? Is this some kind of a main guide ritual? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I need a net. And the owner of the inn took me out to his little shed, and we found a net, and we found a long spear, and we 
taped the spear to the net, and then with everyone, <laughs> I went back to the dock and tried very carefully to scoop out my $350. <laughs> Got it, thank God. And then I did go back and carefully scoop out the now soaking wet fudge. <laughs> um, <coughs> there was great cheering when I hung out. <laughs> and I thought, oh, main guide. You should be so proud of you. <laughs> so I, I got into the canoe and loaded up and still soaking wet. Um, and paddled away from the crowds <laughs> steering me on. And when I got around the point, unlike John, I just burst into laughter. I laughed for a half an hour after that because I thought, you know, you are so full of yourself. <laughs> and look at yourself. <laughs> so that night, um, the dog and I laid out the $350 in $20 bills <laughs> under rocks on the picnic table, dried it out, had a good supper, had the fudge for dessert, and the rest of the trip went just fine. <laughs> Many more of those stories than there are, John. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. How was the fudge after it had been at the bottom of the lake? A little watery. <laughs> Chocolate or peanut butter? Chocolate. Um, next up, we have Amy Chapman. Come on up, Amy. She will be sharing a story with us today about, about her camp. Okay, um, this is my mom's shirt. I got it out of the closet at camp this morning where it's probably been hanging for 60 years. It smells a little like mothballs, a little like mouse poop, a little like pine boards, and it's pretty much the best smell in the world. So mine's not an adventure story. Mine's an origin story. So every one of us has an origin story. If you're a comic book superhero, your origin story is the story of how you got your superpowers. Maybe you escaped in the nick of time from an exploding planet, or you got bitten by a radioactive spider. <laughs> if you're a mere mortal like the rest of us, your origin story is the story of the people, places, and events that shaped your life and made you who you are. This is my origin story. In 1954, my parents bought a lakefront lot on North Pond in Woodstock, Maine. They paid $200. And the next summer, they came back with their four kids, ages 5 to 11. And they cleared and leveled a building site. And they started to build what my family has always called camp. It was never meant to be a cottage or a lake house. We weren't that fancy. It was just camp with exposed rafters and tiny little bedrooms and an open loft that was always full of the lumpiest beds in the world. <laughs> My father had grown up here in Bethel, just a few miles away, and he was an avid outdoorsman. He was a scout leader, a hiker, a rock hound, and he always knew that his exile in Connecticut and then later New Jersey was only temporary. Like a lot of Mainers in the 1930s and 1940s, my dad had left home after college to seek his fortune, and that exile was the price he paid to profit from his University of Maine metallurgical engineering degree. But every summer, my mother and the kids were installed at camp as soon as school got out. My father would drive up from New Jersey every weekend and for his annual vacation and spend the summers there. It was always understood that when he retired, they would spend their summers on the lake and their winters on a house that they would buy or build on a hill in Bethel. That was the plan. Then in 1958, my father had a heart attack. My mother remembered that when he came home from work that day and went directly to bed, it was the first time she had ever known him to be ill. <clears throat> a little while later, he called her upstairs when I got there, she told me once, he just died. 
My mother was 38 years old. She had four grief-stricken kids, now ages 8 to 14. And when the funeral was over, she put them in the station wagon with the family dog and they drove from New Jersey to Maine to spend the summer because, she said, it was what we had planned and I couldn't think of anything else to do. Sometimes I sit on the deck at camp and I look out at North Pond and I wonder how on earth my mother ever had the strength to come there that summer. To throw open the windows and air out the mattresses and sweep away the mouse poops. Just keep getting up in the morning. Let alone the strength to feed and nurture her four kids. And over the next few summers to supervise the completion of the camp, which will never really be finished. <laughs> but she did. Uh, by midsummer, my mother began to suspect something. And by the end of the summer, she knew she was pregnant. I was born early the following March, and in June that year, the family came to camp to spend the summer, just like always. My mother laid a blanket on the big oak table in front of the window, laid me on it on my stomach so I could raise my head and look out the window at, the, at North Pond. I was three and a half, four months old. It was my first summer at camp. This summer is my 60th and I haven't ever missed one. My brother Steve likes to say that I wasn't born in Maine, but I got here as soon as I could. <laughs> Connecticut, where my family moved later that year, was where we went to school and later my mother got a job there as a school librarian. We had friends in Connecticut and all the usual growing up things happened in Connecticut. But we all knew that our real lives happened at camp. Every June, when we would pull off of Route 26 and onto the dirt road that led the last mile to camp, we'd have to throw open the door of the station wagon and let our Cocker Spaniel, Lucky, jump out and run the last mile before, beside the car. If we didn't, he would claw our legs bloody trying to jump out the window. <laughs> and you know what? If it would have gotten us there a moment sooner, we would all have jumped out and run right along with him. My mom spent 50 summers at camp, and in 50 years, there was never a summer morning that she didn't wake up, look out the window, and see if the lake was steaming or choppy or smooth. And if there was no wind stirring the surface, she would tell people, when I got up this morning, the lake was just like glass. <laughs> she would hold both hands out in front of her flat, palms down and say it for 50 years, always with the same hint of awe in her voice, just like glass. Thank you. Um, so up next is Jeff Angevine. He is a Bethel native, and I have no Why idea what his story is going to be about. I just asked him to please start at the beginning. It have a middle and an end, and not to swear. Um, so hopefully you can do that. Come on up. Thank you. Yeah. I was voluntold to be here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different stories growing up here, uh, spending all my life here. Uh, many good stories about our camp too, and that we have. But there's, we were just chatting, and there's one that um, it's a it's a different path. I've been on the Bethel Fire Department for 16, 17 years, and this man right here for a, for a while was, uh, he came on and joined us and helped us out, and uh, <laughs> you hadn't been on more than a month, it's Doug Alfred, but, and uh, we had a woods fire, or four, like a wildfire down in um, Woodstock, and it, was, it wasn't like a, we didn't really at the time, it wasn't like up in the trees as much. It was like all on the ground, a lot of the duff and stuff, and we ended up on the leading edge of the fire that was climbing up the hill, and we were really racing against time to get up there, and um, met multiple crews from multiple different towns. But while we were up there, and we, some of the things that we were joking about is, you were in your, you were in your 50s, we were in there, you know, I was in my 30s, myself and this other, uh, a couple of the guys that were with us, and he was just happy to do anything. So we'd get, we'd be out like trying to stop the fire, get you know, get out in front, and do our thing, and he'd be like, 
running back and forth to the truck where the water was and stuff and filling up Indian tanks and bringing them back to us. And, and uh, then the helicopter came in. Now, he doesn't really have any experience at all. Like, he's just oh, no. out there with us. We're just, he's happy to do anything. He's like, yeah, just tell me, I'll go. He's like, okay. So we were, we were on the leading edge trying to stop it before it made up. Um, there's no real fire break at all. So we're really working hard and then the helicopter came in. And what you do is there's a, there's a contact from the Forest Service that talks directly to the helicopter and tells it where to go. And we called that guy. Well, we were on the leading edge of the fire and we were actually kind of stealing loads from other other uh, crews working because we take our we have yellow shirts that we wear just like you see on TV in the California wildfires. We took them off and we're waving them over our heads. And the helicopter would come out, we'd get the water and it's kind of slow the fire down. Um, but we, I kept warning him, I was like, make sure that we're out of the way. When the, when the, get, it's called in the black. So you get the fire still going that way, just get in the black and get, get back a little bit. And we were kind of working a little frantically and we were on the front edge of this fire and the one came over and it kind of splashed us a little bit, probably from me to you guys. And then the next time that came in, and I'm telling him, when the helicopter comes in, keep your heads up. Look for this bucket that's going to come over your head. And we came in, and I looked up. <laughs> and I yelled to him, turtle, which means we're left just put your head like this. Because it, it came in. It was a very, very hot day. It came in and just flattened us. About 300 gallons of water and just flattened us. And he stands up, and I'm like, oh, he's never coming back. <laughs> he stands up, and he shakes off. And Whoa, that was refreshing. <laughs> my story. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. No. <laughs> I grew up in the White Mountains at the sort of other end, Waterville, Waterville Valley, and uh, in college I, by college I worked um, for Dartmouth College at the Moose Lock Ravine Lodge, which is a, a rustic mountain lodge built um, with some of the timbers that were salvaged from the hurricane of 1938 um, from, from the uh, second college grant just north of Arrow. Beautiful mountain lodge. Um, right under Mount Moose Lock, three miles up a dirt road, and then 10 miles from the end of the dirt road to the little town of North Woodstock. And we worked in various capacities, um, um, handy men and women uh, serving food in the lodge to hikers and other guests, and um, generally just enjoying being college age in the White Mountains and beautiful area. <laughs> It was a pretty quiet, uh, tended to be pretty pretty quiet summer life up there. Um, we had laundry needs, so occasionally we would, a bunch of us, pile into uh, somebody's car, drive down the three mile dirt road, down the 10 mile, basically um, unpopulated road to the town of North Woodstock, which as many of you know, is just south of Franconia Notch, the tourist attractions, what was called Clark's Train Bears, I think it's now called Clark's Trading post, it's been sanitized a little bit more politically correct. The town of North Woodstock, I'd compare to something between Bethel and Andover. And in the 1980s, that was a pretty sleepy little town. Had a laundromat where we started on July 10th, 1981. And we put our wash in, and then we'd pass the time by putting people in. Putting people in a dryer, big industrial dryers, and <laughs> put a quarter in, let it spin around until a person pounded it on the window. And that's good for about 10 minutes of, of laughs, and then it's time to move on to something else. So we went down uh, 
a couple buildings to the Truant's Tavern. Truant's, Truant's Tavern was the upper business that was open at that time on a, on a weeknight in North Woodstock, New Hampshire. There was not a whole lot going on at Truant's Tavern besides the five of us um, <laughs> having a beer while our, our clothes were, uh, were drying. Hot night. Um, North Woods, hot, humid, moonless, um, and, and dark um, off of the main street. So the Pemajuas River rises out of the um, White Mountains and comes down to the back of town, like a lot of mill towns. The river is right behind Main Street. And so we said, let's, let's go for a swim. We walked down a small path. 50, 100 yards from Main Street. Um, really dark, nobody was down there. Um, we'd been there before, so we knew where to go. Took off our clothes, put them on a rock, and just started, you know, feeling our way downstream with our feet, um, enjoying the cool water, keeping in kind of a loose group of five of us. Um, two men, three women, all college age. And just kind of enjoying talking to each other, as we came um, came back up the, up the river, we got to where our, we put our clothes, you know, and you stuck your watch in a pocket, your wallet in a shoe. And the first thing we noticed, our, our clothes aren't where we left them. And we started looking around in really dark. It's light enough that you could make out a person's figure, the shape, but not so that you could really tell much about them. And we noticed there's a, a man there, um, no idea how old, and also no clothes on. And he's pulling our clothes, or some of our clothes, out of the river and putting them on the rock. And in the next 30 seconds, um, the evening was about to change dramatically. <laughs> the next thing that happened was we heard an ear-splitting, uh, what was hard to know was a loud firecracker, like an M80 or a Jerry bomb, or we, you know, hard to know what it was, from the, from sort of the river bank side. And, uh oh, we have to go, uh, <laughs> with, uh, oh, here we go. Good, good time for a little pause. <laughs> Again, it's about uh, 50 or 100 yards from Main Street, very dark, and um, you can just make out the lights of Main Street, a little like dim glow. Um, and then we noticed uh, a sort of a white t-shirt, and then a girl's or young woman's voice saying something like, don't move or nobody move, nobody move or I'll shoot or something like that. <laughs> So there are five of us standing in a group, a man we've never met, none of us with clothes on, <laughs> our clothes floating around, and um, you know, it's one of those things that things happen so fast, I'm slowing it down a little bit, but um, within 30 seconds of the first loud noise um, and, and the girl yelling, the guy took a couple steps away from our group and uh, as if maybe to distract her from us, we thought. Um, and the next thing we know, there was a gunshot, and the, the man lying on the ground, just howling um, in pain. And uh, two or three of my friends thought it was a joke. They thought it was the locals just playing with us. And, uh, and I, I was like, no, this is not good. This is not acting. <laughs> And so I, I said, you guys get down, you know, because I thought, God, guy in pain, been shot, uh, we got to get behind a rock or something, and we did, the two of us did, um, and I thought, you know, we got to get an ambulance for this guy. And so uh, two of us, my girlfriend's best friend, Viva, uh, she and I ran up through the woods, and I'm thinking, Got to get in the ambulance. This is poison ivy habitat. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
there were some, a few other thoughts, and I was just saying, oh my, my god, I can't believe this. <laughs> and so the two of us go up, push back into the woods, 50, 100 yards, and the nearest light turns out to be Truant's Tavern, um, <laughs> which I figure is the nearest phone. So I, I said, I got up to the parking lot, and I said, Viva, why don't you wait here? Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah. and so I ran in, and there was a stack of those tourism tabloids, uh, and so I, I grabbed one. Uh, it's a makeshift wine cloth. And, and I distinctly remember seeing there were people at the bar. And uh, and I, I you know I burst in and I could see the bartender saw me and bartenders they know when something's wrong. And I could just tell he was not gonna let me get anywhere near his customers. And uh, and it came out and I said, "You got to call an, got to call 911. Guys, been shot down up the river." And so he, he did. Gave me a pair of shorts very quickly. <laughs> he came out. Somebody had found a blouse for my friend Eva. You're back on the mic now. Back on the mic now. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, meanwhile, my friends are still down chiding the the locals for this this raid. Uh, uh, so we were we were interrogated and not interrogated we were interviewed by the uh, local police that night until like midnight I think it was um, and said you'll be hearing from us for a court date the story from here on is, is sort of the aftermath uh, because it's always curious well, what happened why well the the girl was minor so um, I went back years later actually and tried to find out well, what happened and they couldn't release the records in um, her lifetime because she was a minor. We testified in court. We, we stared nervously at Ted and answered the questions. The uh, defense attorney for the, um, for the, for the girl um, questioned why we all said, or many of us said, that this thing about nobody move or I'll shoot, but none of us would put it in our police report. So this is called, a bit of truth is in the title of this talk. And, you know, you, you sort of never know exactly. There's all these stories that go around, and they start to magnify themselves. Um, and the girl had married the the man later. They were she was a jilted lover at that time, but they made up after he recovered. Um, we, we saw him in the shoot at the first stage, and he was we sort of exchanged nervous like. <laughs> yeah, came, but he recovered. They got married, but then they split up. And I never wanted to probe more into that whole story than, than that. Um, but I guess the, at, at the end of the day, um, we thought, or I thought, you know, life is going to have these things. They're going to happen like this all the time. This is just, you know, another another uh, another event in, in, in your life. And, you know, life has been been great since then, but there's certainly never anything um, like that has, has happened um, to me. I don't think. But um, it ain't over yet. It ain't, it ain't over yet. And what it, what it told me was the lesson I think I took away with it is, and it probably changed me then was that life is full of possibility, and you just never know what's going to happen. Then. <laughs> I can show you. Yeah. I've thought I've been involved in a lot of three different parties, but I've never heard of one like that. Yeah, yeah, that's terrifying. Um, thank you very much, Kurt. Liz Repetto, you're up next. Welcome, Bethel newcomer. Yep. By way of Anchorage. Another. I'm another volunteer. So like that. Well, I'm, I'm not responsible for that. I'll try it, but I'm also with hands, so I'm wondering, can people yeah. hear me? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, I might need to just because I, when I get nervous, I do this. So this might go flying. And <laughs> so my name's Liz. Like, music, you can't hear. Oh, okay. But there is a lot of. No, 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 I, no, 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 Okay. I'm good. Yeah, just point this. I grew up in um, Yarmouth, Maine. Um, Kurt and Nina Scribner, my parents, they're still there. That's what brought me back to Maine. I've been found Alaska in 2000, and my husband up there, he's from Maryland. Um, and we've been up there ever since. But I just want to say thank you. Another gathering of locals that make me realize I'm in the right place. So it's wonderful to be here. So I can't believe I'm up here. Um, so it's applause to you 
guys. Um, I don't know what the storyline should be to this story, so I'm just going to tell it with a couple disclaimers. I'm not a fisherman. I grew up mackerel fishing in Casco Bay in the summer just because it was fun, and I put the jig on, and I just did it because my brothers did it, like many things I do in life. Um, and then the second thing, as an adult, I've been trying not to live with shoulds in my life, as I think many people, especially moving back to Maine, we shouldn't have a lot of shoulds in our life. But I am up here because someone said I should do it. <laughs> so about 10 years ago, I'm going to say, um, in Alaska, so I'm an educator, I'm a school counselor, and in the summers, unfortunately, they're filled with shoulds, just like the weekends. It's your free time, and should do this, should do that, should do this. And Alaska is similar to Maine. There's so many incredible things you're invited to do a lot of. Um, and on this day, my friend David, Sarah and David, they fish a lot. They're great um, hunters. And I was invited to go fishing with David. And I'm going to call him my guide. He wasn't a special guy, but incredibly experienced fisherman. In Alaska, they call it, there's a form of fishing called combat fishing. I'm sure you might have heard about combat fishing is um, because in Alaska, um, there's only a few areas where, um, or there are a few areas where they actually build a huge parking lot to access the rivers, and it allows uh, hundreds of people to access a river, and they all want that sa those salmon when they're coming in. So I would say Bird Creek on this August day, right after a high tide, um, tide was going out, there was definitely the combat fishing um, going on. This is about 20 miles south of Anchorage. Again, summer, I was invited, I should go. Borrowed my husband's waders, um, had to borrow a reel from David. Now, what I liked was it was a spinner reel. It looked just like what I used in Casco Bay when I was 10. I was like, I got this, I can do this. A little bar that you flip over. And, <laughs> and so um, I had my bear spray. He, of course, had his gun. And it was just, it was really fun. So we're walking down. And I felt pretty cool, and I didn't think there was ego involved in this day, but I looked back and I was like, I think I was really liking this. This was cool, walking down with Dave and a fisherman, and we're going to go fishing. Uh, then I got to the, kind of the mud flats, you know, the tide had come in and out, and you got to walk down. But I made it, and I got my situation, I got situated, and he actually went about two or three fisher people up from me. I'm not sure why he wasn't next to me, in hindsight, no, no. Um, and to kind of the south of me, definitely 15 to 20 people fishing. Um, I got my hook in the water, and I don't know time frame, but it was pretty quick that all of a sudden that it came right back to me. The the the, um, the rod, something was on that rod, and it, I literally was a child again on the dock in Casco Bay. I had a fish on, and I was just so excited about it, and so I thought I've got to reel it in. So. The weight of that, seeing that, I just felt like this is awesome. And I'm hearing, and I'm like, I'm supposed to reel in. So I'm doing this, and I think, in hindsight, adrenaline and stuff, I think fear, nervousness is building up in me because, oh, and I forgot this whole story. I'm forgetting. Brown bear across the way, which is common in Alaska. Brown bear is more interested in, um, in the fish. They didn't care about the probably less than 100 fishermen. Um, but that was up on the bank, upriver. Um, and so my point being that back to childhood, I'm 10 there and I have a fish on and I'm excited. I'm forgetting about the bear. I'm forgetting about all the people, unfortunately, because suddenly I realized the, um, something's not right. My intuition is going, I think if I wanted to flight, I, if I could have, I would have. And I look, and all of a sudden, all eyes are on me like I'm the brown bear. These fishermen who really know what they're doing are suddenly looking upriver, and I'm feeling these looks at me. And nothing's changing. It was like, oh, you're caught in time. And I'm really enjoying this. And then I'm like, oh. So I look, and I completely use my helpline, which I still do in my life. And I'm like, David? David, and the water's kind of running out, so it's loud, and I had to yell for David for help, which I didn't really like doing. And he looked, and his look looked right at me like everybody else was. So what was happening was, my fish didn't want to be any part of me. I had not, operator error, which I'm told often by my husband, I hadn't turned it into uh, intake mode or whatever on the reel. I was not reeling in. That fish was winning, and it was heading back out. And it was choosing a line that was immediately across every other fish line. Oh, hey, oh, hey. I didn't know this at the time. I now know what So David, being very smart, probably knowing a lot of them, it just right on task. Kind of like 
um, the producer, like he just knew, all right, here we go. He cut the line and just firm, almost like a parent to a child. Okay, let's, really, let's go. all right, we're gonna go. And the next thing I know, we're, we're walking up. <laughs> <laughs> so in hindsight, and then that night I was at Sportsman's Warehouse buying a gift card for the reel that I had broke, you know, the, um, the but I, anyway, it was, a, it was a fun story to look back on and realize I definitely did bring ego there. I didn't think I did. And all those eyes that look back on me, um, I think I probably ruined their day. And that, that, that Bird Creek, actually, anytime we go um, skiing in the winter, you drive by that twice. And that story is always started. <laughs> anyway, that's my
say, wow, dude, that's quite the musical. And suddenly, the doors in the back of the hall burst open. First to expose big rock and ugly nose. A bull moose. A sportsman, ha, they all jump under the table. <laughs> so, what do I got to do? I get the lady moose call. Woo, 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 woo. And the big moose, he come up and stand by me. <laughs> now, those sportsmen, they are very impressed. They say, Daniel, you are world champion, who's called it? <laughs> then I say, well, this is great, dude, but now I've got to uh, go home, and I cannot leave the moose in New York City. I might get mugged or something. <laughs> so what am I going to do? So I take the moose with me on the train, and then I, I take him all the way back to my village in the north of Quebec. I get up there, and, and I get off the train, and I walk into the edge of the village. And I told him, it's time for you to go. And as you disappear into the woods, I think, I think I see a little sawdust dripping from his left hind leg. Well, a week later, I get another letter from one of those sportsmen in New York City. And inside the letter, there's enclosed a clipping from the New York Times with a story about the mysterious disappearance of the big bull moose from the class case at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> Kids are running around. I'll get the water on. 
And, and outward bound required at that time that we take a, a tent so in case of emergency. So the tent was set up, and they grabbed <laughs> one of them, and they throw them into the tent, and there's four or five of them in there with them. And from the outside, if you've ever seen the old lad from all park drinks where the, the can suddenly you big bubbles appear in the side of it. Well, the tent looked like that. I mean, there was this way, that way, this way, everywhere. And I could hear these screams from inside, and I, get him, he's, 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 he's hallucinating, he's, he's going down so fast. And all this very calm voice says, not the underwear. And then, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's losing it, he's hypothermic, he doesn't know what he said, get him off. And there's more. <laughs> and I've always wondered. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said about that story. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't just learn my skills, you know, just like it, it wasn't just, you know, it didn't come from heaven or anything. I learned from practice. <laughs> Off. 
and uh, eventually we came to a, a ski trail and we took the ski trail down and uh, um, you know to foreshadow the uh, rescue experience uh, Dave Walker graciously uh, drove up to Sunday River and picked us up so we didn't have to make the long, long walk back <laughs> Right. So yeah, that's what you always have in lemon drop. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's uh, that's the wilderness. But uh, you know, the more interesting thing about that story is uh, that was many years ago. Barely knew Nancy then and Dave, and um, uh, here we are, thirty somewhat years later, and. Uh, Still friends, <laughs> and you know, that's that's the cool thing about this uh, area. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five years ago, almost, I was married, and a month later, they were too. So, uh, yeah, so here we go. The binding power Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change the pace. Oh, I, well, I'll tell one. I'll, oh. I'll tell a quick one. <laughs> it, what's your plan after that? I'll go after her. Oh, right. I just want to tell a quick one. I, I used to lead a lot of canoe trips with Ray Cooley, and many of you know Ray Cooley, and we used to take kids all kinds of places. And one time, Nate was there. Where are you, Nate? There you are. On the Allagash with your father and your grandfather on one trip. It was just one of those memorable times that I really enjoyed the three of you together. Well, I'm going to tell a, t a story about motivation, and it's, uh, I had a bunch of kids. This particular trip was all girls. Okay, fine, I don't care. So we were doing the Bow Branch, and you know there is about a mile portage on the Bow Branch, and so we were all there. We're all learning to take the canoe and paddle and go in the right direction, and that was going great. And we got there to the portage. And like, oh, these girls were like, oh my gosh, it's too far. I don't know if I can carry the canoe and all our equipment and all our gear. Well, Ray and I had taken one trip over and gotten some of the, the canoes over. And the Boy Scouts were at the other end of this particular port. <laughs> so we came back and we said, I said to the girls, guess what? All the boys in the Boy Scout troop are over there. Let's go. Every girl carried it. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. The motivation was amazing. Of course, we got to the other end of this portage when the boy stopped just taking off. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm going to go from back here. So, I grew up in Florida, handicapped from the get go. When I was in high school, Desperate, knowing I didn't belong there. I'm cruising along my high school, which was huge, and it was Florida. And I saw a poster on the wall about a college, and it hooked me because on the poster, kids were twitching out logs with draft horses. <laughs> I have no idea what they're doing or why, but I stole the poster. <laughs> because there was only one opening left, I was going. So I applied, and I got into Sterling College, which is in the Northeast oh. Kingdom of Vermont. Oh. It was a game changer for me. I met people who had all of these skills, suburban Florida to rural Vermont. And at Sterling, you know, your first week there, they take you by twos and they drop you off in the middle of the night and say, good luck, get back to campus. And then I found out the faculty bet on you. <laughs> so I'm thrilled, I'm learning all this stuff, I'm in my groove and feeling on top of the world. And there was a, a professor from another college who took a shine and realized this woman has had absolutely no experience doing anything that's worthwhile. I'm going <laughs> to offer her a little something more. So he came to me and he said, would you like to do a little research project with me? And of course, this is Sterling College. This is going to be great. Absolutely. And he said, well, I have a telemetry project that I'm doing, you know, radio collaring animals. And I'm thinking immediately, oh, oh, black bear, we're going to do black bear, maybe coyote, foxes, excellent. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. And then he said, yeah, I'm doing porcupines. <laughs> oh, no. Data shows that your frontal decision-making lobe is not complete when you're still 19 years old. This is true. So rather than saying, really? I said, 
sure, sure, why not? This is a professor, he's good, I'm in. And so for the next few days, during this whole process time, it never really dawned on me the steps one must take to do research on a porcupine. Like, first you have to catch them. <laughs> so we spent about a couple of, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks wandering the woods where I got really good at wrapping compass because what, you don't call them. Come on in, porcupine. So we would wander and look, and finally we found one. We had it in a tree. We got up early. And there it is. It's out on the end of a maple branch. So it's the professor who will remain anonymous, myself, and one other student. And it's about, oh, 20, 30 feet up. I'm looking, thinking, okay, this is where the professor steps in. He's got a plan. He has no plan. No plan. He says, go up, Barb, and Bob, truly a Bob, and go to the end of the branch and just bounce it. <laughs> because according to his professorial smarts, it will get the porcupine to come back. Remember, my frontal lobe is not engaged. <laughs> I go up. To this day, I don't even know how I got up. But I did. And I'm bouncing. And I'm at the end. And Bob is below a few branches down. It was a, a you know, that was his son. That's what I remember. And so, by, I'll be damned. You bounce a branch, and a porcupine does turn around and head back. <laughs> so, so, Bob, the professor who is safely 20 or 30 feet on the ground, I yelled down. I think my voice might have been a few octaves higher. So, Bob, it's heading towards me. What do I do? And he said, very calmly, very professorially, Barb, climb up. Porcupines never go up. <laughs> the porcupine had not read that book. So I scrambled up a little bit more, and I forget why I wasn't all the way to top of the tree by now, but I stopped. And that porcupine got on my leg. <laughs> so I had been doing some reading about porcupines. And all that could go through my brain at this time was, they have about 10,000 quills. <laughs> and it's on my leg, and I'm 20 or 30 feet up in a tree, and the guy responsible for this is on the ground safely. <laughs> and so you know when you get nervous and you want to be really still, and your body just messes you up, and you just start shaking? That's what my leg is doing. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm shaking the leg with the porcupine with 2,000 quills. I'm 20 feet up. And I, two octaves higher, say, oh, it's on my leg. What do I do now? And he said, he didn't call <laughs> To be truthful, I don't remember exactly what happened next, but Bob, so we were prepared to catch a porcupine. So we had the official porcupine catching net. <laughs> Somehow or other, I think probably my eyeballs were screwed shut. <laughs> Got the net and scooped him off of my leg. And, and didn't even drop him. Lowered him to the, Kim, it was her, to the ground. And we got it in a cage. <laughs> no clue. I got down. I don't know how. I did. Recovered. Never thought quite the same of this professor again. <laughs> but now we're kind of locked at the hips. I don't have a quill in me. I don't think I threw up, but I might have after that point in time. <laughs> then, now, so now we have first one. And he turns to me like, of course, he's been through nothing at this point. So, okay, Barb, now we need to get the collar on. <laughs> so, you know, when you, as an adult, you kind of sort of think of the steps that you have to take. Well, this would be that other one I hadn't thought about. When you sign up for research projects, you have to anesthetize the person. Oh, no. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. Once again, this guy's got a plan. He's got a plan. So he goes to his truck, he opens his box, and brings out these big, huge, long, like what you would put up to here, leather, mitts. 
Let's guess what my job is. <laughs> Put the mitts on Barb, kind of wave your hands in front of him, and then grab onto him. So on this, the mitts will keep you safe while I shoot him in the butt from behind. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it did. <laughs> wow. So while all of you were out there enjoying fishing, paddling, <laughs> beautiful scenery, there's a whole segment of us who think quite a bit different about that. <laughs> So I'll try to keep it fairly short. Okay. But in Baldanian beef, so that's how they ought to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I like them. Huh? Why did I do that? I don't know. <laughs> I used to live in the house that I think is called Carriage House now, back behind Sudbury. Yeah. I grew up there. My best buddies were Chip Gasser, Jessica Bain. I hated the bottomers when they moved here because they kicked Jessica out of her house. And I thought that was rude. I learned to love them afterwards. They were amazing people, but. Uh, I spent every chance I could coming back to Bethel when my family started moving around and of course the whites were home base. Steve, it would be a great foreign language teacher because he teaches in the way we call immersion learning. <laughs> we just throws you into the situation and you figure it out. When I was, yeah, when I was 12, he, he sent me out back to figure out how a hydraulic log splitter works. So it was that kind of work. <laughs> Um, but uh, this story kind of touches on uh, Amy's origin story, which I almost wiped out by accident one day. I was here visiting, I was early in college, and uh, Steve left me a vehicle to drive around in. I was out at the camp, and it was a Willis. 46. Willis 46. This, is, this thing comes from another planet. <laughs> I, I knew how to drive a, a standard shifter. I knew how to do it on two continents, left and right side of the car. I couldn't figure out the Willis at all. <laughs> the center st shift uh, lever is this weird curvy thing, and there's another lever that goes with it, and there's a button, and I couldn't find where the key went at all. So that was my vehicle. I had to get into town. Um, so I managed to get it going a little bit, and of course it conked out right away. And at that point, it, I was on a hill. <laughs> so I thought, well, this is all right. I'll roll it a little bit. Maybe I can get it started. So I get it rolling, and I can't find the brakes. And this is the problem with the Willis that I didn't realize either. It's got unusual pedal situation or something down there. I just, the whole thing was a mystery to me. At this point, we're getting close to Amy's cabin, and which is her home. <laughs> and the Willis starts going off the side of the road. Oh. And those of you who've been out to North Pond know that's a pretty steep yeah. slope off there. A lot of trees, so it may not have hit the cabin. So I leap out, run over the hood of the vehicle. I'm <laughs> pointing something, so I figure I can stop this, right? <laughs> I jumped in the front of this thing, and I'm grabbing the Willis like this as it's running toward Amy's house. And, the, the, and we reach the edge of the road, and the bank starts giving away below me. So I'm sliding down underneath the willow, and the thing's coming over the head of me, and I get it stopped just as the wheels are about to go over the edge. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around, there's a boulder next to my foot, and I've got one leg in this soft duck, and the other leg I'm trying to pull the boulder in like this, I'm thinking Amy's going to kill me. Or you're going to kill Amy. Or I'm going to kill Amy. And then just then Amy walks out. She comes outside and looks up and goes, Hi, Scott. <laughs> I'm sitting there with this will. Like, Hi, Amy. <laughs> she just stands there looking at me for a minute and then kind of wanders up, picks up the rock, sticks it under the wheel of the truck. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well, I didn't wipe out Amy's cabin. <laughs> but uh, those of you who lived here a long time and, and know... Amy and Steve, you know, you know the kind of people, how great it is to come spend time with them. Melinda, I've known forever, um, so it's nice to see you here too. And so many of the stories I heard here today remind me how much I, I love this area. I still think of this as my home. So, 
every time I get away, it's great to come back. And Steve caught me this morning getting out of bed and said, come on, and dragged me to the stories. And it's been an excellent morning. I thank you all for telling these great stories. It makes me feel at home. So thank you. Kill them or make them stronger, right? So I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for coming out. And thank you for sharing your stories. It was nice how they sort of all started to intertwine a little bit. The end. <laughs> yeah. Calling out people for things that happened years ago. <laughs> like you said, Steve, that is one of the things that makes this place so great and so wonderful. Our the like-minded, fun, helpful, caring people that live here. So, Can I end with a...